You're listening to The Stephen Toriello Show, building a platform of liberty for people in search of truth with a dash of hope and a life worth living. The Stephen Toriello Show. And now, here's Stephen. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the show. As always, thank you for tuning in. And as always, we got a lot to get into, but I was scrolling through social media and I ran across this article from the New York Times. It says, is the partisan divide too big to be bridged? It's actually a pretty catchy title because I know that's what a lot of people are thinking. How are we going to move on as a country if we can't come together and agree to disagree. I think it's important for the American people to first find what we do agree on. And unfortunately, that's not much anymore. This is the problem that I've been noticing the last six or seven or eight years. Um, Donald Trump has certainly brought in a type of hatred for him um, that pretty much changes what people think or what they've thought their entire lives. So what up must be down now. If Donald Trump says something is good, then the people that hate him say it's bad. If Donald Trump cured cancer, they would demand that he be impeached for overpopulating the earth. This is something I've noticed, and it's really, really causing a massive divide. And you notice this during COVID. I thought COVID was going to be a, a uniting moment in this country, much like 9-11. Um, we actually talked about 9-11 a while back ago and how there was no crime in the country for like 24 hours. Not one crime after that tragedy. And unfortunately, it's, it's tragedy sometimes that brings us together, much like funerals for our families. Um, unfortunately that is, you know, a lot of the times that I see my family together is during a funeral. It's, it's unfortunate, but that's just the way that it's just the way that it is. And much like the American people, it takes a tragedy for the American people to come together. But that actually changed with Donald Trump. Uh, it didn't happen during COVID. And I guarantee you, if we were to break into World War III right now, it wouldn't happen. Donald Trump has psychologically and emotionally broken people. This is why I say the Trump derangement syndrome, okay, Trump derangement syndrome, diagnosing people with Trump derangement syndrome must happen. Because until, just like a drug addict, until you admit you have a problem, you can't resolve it. And I'm sorry, but Trump derangement syndrome is a real thing. And I think people... I'm starting to hear it a lot more now, and I've been saying this for years. Trump derangement syndrome is a real thing, and it's not Donald Trump's fault. You know whose fault it is? Is the media. Yes, when the media decided to pick sides and wanted to turn Donald Trump into this monster, because Donald Trump attacked the media, the media was like, oh no, you're not going to attack us, and they made Donald Trump's life a living hell. And ever since then, it's been this revenge tour for the media to get back at Donald Trump. And they knew the way that they did that was to prove their power. And by proving their power, they wanted to destroy Donald Trump by character assassinating him, turning him into this monster, turning him into Adolf Hitler. And they just kept drilling it into people's heads, drilling it, drilling it, drilling it, reporting on false stories, propaganda feeding their viewers, spoon-feeding their viewers, misinformation and manipulation. That's what we were going through, and this right now is the culmination. You have a divide that is so vast that nobody knows if it could be mended. And I'll be honest, I don't think it can. There's fundamental things we just don't agree on anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't, we can't even agree that America is a great country. Okay, we have a portion of this country. I'm not going to say half because it's not even close to the majority. It's not even close to half. 
but they're the loudest. We have this big faction of people that hate America. These are the people that believe the 1619 Project. People like Joy Reid. Joy Reid is the perfect example of what I'm talking about. They're racists. They hate this country. The very founding of this country, they think, is born out of racism. Or everything about this country is negative. They, they think they have negative views on this country. Even the founding, the framers were, were all slave owners. <clears throat> And they built a justice system that was systemically racist against black minorities. And I'm sorry, it's just not true. However, the media drilling that day after day after day, this is what you get. This is the culmination of eight years of lies and propaganda by a media that has picked sides and has turned into the propaganda arm of the administrative state. That's what we're dealing with. Anyways, to get into this article, I found it actually quite interesting. It says, Bernard Clay, a black middle-aged data analysis and poet from Louisville, Kentucky, was leery when he was thrown together with Shailen Bishop, a shy, white, young biologist who grew up on a family farm in rural Greene County, Kentucky, 15 minutes from the closest town. But over a structured brainstorming session in 2022 amid a weekend retreat with the Kentucky Rural Urban Exchange, something clicked. Mr. Clay, 47, had a side project chronicling Kentucky's black Civil War veterans. Miss Bishop, 34, during quiet hours alone, had pondered the old stones that almost certainly marked the burial grounds of the once enslaved a forgotten memorial to a hidden past. An effort was born the enslaved people of Clay Hill, or EPIC, legacy project to officially recognize the burial ground and a connection was made across the gulfs of race, age, and geography. The nation's poisonous divisions, exacerbated by politicians, cable news, and social media, and collectively known as the outrage industrial complex, have been much lamented. Less noticed is the counterweight, a constellation of nonprofits and other organizations like the Kentucky Rural Urban Exchange devoted to bridging divides, urban and rural, black and white, LGBTQ and straight, left and right, Call it the Kumbaya Industrial Complex. The problem? The starkest divide. Trump-branded conservatism versus the rising political left may be the one where no one is interested in reconciliation. On June 17th, with the backing of Rockefeller Brothers, the MacArthur Foundation, the Immersive Collective, and others, will award its first $8 million to 20 civic groups judged judged the most promising in their efforts to rebuild the community and reinforce democratic values. Another $2 million will come later in the year to meet the trusted pledge of $10 million a year for community-level democracy efforts. This is what I'm talking about. How can you fight for something that you fundamentally don't understand what it is? I am so sick of hearing this word democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not a democracy. These people are trying to fundamentally change our country into something it's not. We are a republic with democratic representation. Democracy only goes as far as how we pick our representation. That is it. But these people don't understand what democracy is. This is the problem. So it doesn't matter how much money you throw at it. You're not going to convince people of something that's just not true. We are not a democracy. These people are going out there, throwing all this money at something on brainwashing people is what they're doing. These people can't even define what a democracy is. I can't tell you how many times I've heard in the last year, because this is the campaign strategy, is to get people to think Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. And so what they do is they just repeat these words, these key phrases. It's literal propaganda. Okay, through through subliminal messaging almost, and they just say this word over and over and over again. How are you going to rebuild a community and reinforce democratic values? What does that even mean when we're not a democracy? So that means these people are trying to rebuild and reinforce something that just doesn't exist. This is what I'm talking about. The fundamental differences that we have right now is that one side 
is living in an alternate reality. And what's sad is that they say we're living in an alternate reality. This is where the divide comes. So you have two sides that think each other are living in alternate realities. But I promise you folks, one side is right and one side is wrong. We are on the right side here. Okay, if you believe that this country is the greatest country to ever exist in human history, you are on the right side. If you believe this country is worth fighting for, you're on the right side. Now, if you are on the side that thinks this country is systemically racist and its, its very founding is racist and must be abolished and you want to erase history, tear down statues, say men can give birth, allow men into women's bathrooms, put men in women's sports, if you're on that side, I assure you, you're not living in reality and you're on the wrong side. And this is how they did it. This is exactly how they did it. What's in this New York Times piece? What is in this New York Times piece is exactly how they did it over the years. Is they're pushing things that just are not true. Okay, they're pushing things that clash, that go directly against the foundational principles and values of this country. We don't value democracy. They don't even know what democracy is. But somehow they think our entire country is at risk because democracy is at risk. And this is the problem. So what New York Times should be doing is spending $8 million reinforcing American values, the constitutional republic. These people hate our constitution. Okay, they say they don't, but yet they're constantly, they're constantly nipping away at it every single day. The freedom of speech, Second Amendment rights, the right to due process. These people have been incrementalizing on our Constitution for the last 10 years. I would say longer. You know, back in the day, we could agree on fundamental things. Like, yes, the Constitution is good. Okay, yes, the, con the, 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 the United States has a rough past. But it doesn't mean it's not the greatest country in the world. It doesn't mean that it can't be better. It doesn't mean it has to be fundamentally changed because of what happened 150 years ago, 200 years ago. This is what these people don't get. So again, I hope I'm making sense here. Sometimes I, I, I talk about these things and I'm not even sure if, if I'm making sense, but and, you get what I'm saying, right? These, we can agree on something when one side is not living in the same reality. We're not even playing the same game, let alone in the same stadium here. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to get at. So these people want to spend millions of dollars essentially brainwashing people into thinking that this country is a democracy and that it's at threat. It's almost exactly what they're doing with climate change. This mysterious, shadowy figure that's constantly looming over the entire planet. That if we don't pump tens of billions or even trillions of dollars into combating it, the entire planet's going to burn. Like, that is what they have done with this climate change. And it's exactly what they're doing to our country. They're trying to claim that this country is something that it's never been. If we were a straight democracy, every single issue would be held up to a vote. And the American people would vote. And it would go, majority wins. That's it. No negotiating. That's it. That's a, that is a true democracy. We are not a democracy. The rest, everything is guided by a constitution. And we've went through this time and time and time again. What is a constitutional republic? Because that's what we are. A constitutional republic is a form of government in which the country is considered a public matter. And the head of the state and other officials are representatives of the people and must govern according to an existing constitution. A democracy doesn't have a constitution. There it is. That's, that's what it is. That's what I've been trying to get to. <laughs> These people are trying to turn this country and reinforce something that just doesn't exist. Our principles and values, our laws, our entire system is based off of a document. Okay, a contract to the people 
that was formed 248, 249 years ago. So what exactly are they spending money to reinforce in this New York Times article? In Kentucky, it is a brainwashing effort in red states. Okay, it is a way for these nonprofits, these NGOs to go into red states, infiltrate the red states, and try and rebuild and, and brainwash from the inside out to cause this rot. And this is happening in Kentucky. And what they'll call it is exactly what the New York Times called it. A, a effort to reinforce and rebuild the thoughts of democracy. And it's going to be like some nonprofit. It is a nonprofit, actually, isn't it? Isn't that what the article said? <laughs> a constellation of nonprofits and other organizations like the Kentucky Rural Urban Exchange devoted to bridging divides. Urban and rural, black and white, LGBTQ and straight, left and right, call it Kumbaya Industrial Complex. And so these nonprofits are going to infiltrate deep red states like Kentucky, and they're going to try and brainwash into people into saying, it's kumbaya, just come together. Can't we agree? Can we just agree that we must protect democracy? It's like, well, wait a minute, but we're not a democracy. So what are you talking about? What we should do is just follow the damn constitution. We don't have to, we don't have to reinforce anything. But these people don't like the constitution. The Constitution is constantly in their way. They can't control what people are saying if they are abiding by a Constitution because the Constitution protects people's right to free speech. It protects the freedom of the press. They can't nibble away and incrementalize on Second Amendment rights if we're abiding by a Constitution. So the only way to get around this is by getting rid of the Constitution. The only way of getting rid of the Constitution is by what? is by convincing people we're not a constitutional republic, but we are a democracy. That is exactly what I'm trying to say. And that's what this institution is doing. This constellation of nonprofits and organizations like the Kentucky Rural Urban Exchange. <laughs> so you have the rule of law. Government operates under a set of laws and principles laid out in a constitution, which is the supreme legal document. Elected representatives, leaders and officials are elected by the citizens to represent their interests and make decisions on their behalf. The government is typically divided into branches, executive, legislative, and judicial, to prevent any one branch from, being, from becoming too powerful. Well, with a democracy, you don't have that. Like I said, a democracy is straight down the ballot, yes, no decision by everybody. There is no representatives. There is no guiding document. It is just straight yes or no and majority rules. There is no three branches. There is no presidency. This is what these people are trying to do. They're trying to reinforce something that just doesn't exist. So the democratic process, while the government is based on Republican principles, it also incorporates democratic processes, such as voting and majority rule to ensure that it will be to ensure that the will of the people is reflected in government decisions. Accountability. Elected officials are accountable to the people and can be removed from office through elections or other legal processes if they fail to adhere to their duties or the Constitution. Well, that is they they pretty much destroyed accountability. You see what I'm saying, folks, like they're slowly starting to erode the foundational pillars of our republic. And this has been their goal from day one. And they always use sneaky workarounds like nonprofits and NGOs to reinforce, as they say in quotations, the idea of democracy in, in deep red states. This is how they do it, man. And so how do you get around the Constitution? By just convincing people it doesn't exist, <laughs> that we're not a constitutional republic. That's what they're trying to do. And you call me a conspiracy theorist all you want, but this is what I've been watching for the last 10 years of my life. The media doesn't hide it. The newspapers don't hide it. The press doesn't hide it. Our government officials don't even hide it anymore. These people are not hiding what they're doing anymore. They will straight up come out, use a court in a politically favored jur jurisdiction, and they will weaponize that court against their political opponents. They're not even hiding it anymore. <laughs> okay, they will come straight out and say, Yes, screw your freedoms. You heard Arnold Schwarzenegger say that during the COVID pandemic. Screw your freedoms. Screw the Second Amendment. 
Guns are scary. It is. It, it, and you know what? This is this is the key. This is like it just hit my mind. And the perfect example of this was during COVID. <laughs> we seen the left's true motive during the pandemic. You guys seen it. We all seen it. These people were a bunch of tyrants when they held the keys to the castle. When they had power, they wielded that power like a weapon against their opponents. And that is exactly what they want. But like I said, the only thing standing in their way is a constitution. So the United States is a constitutional republic. We knew that. It establishes a federal system with an elected president a legislator, a Congress, and an independent, ju- uh, independent judiciary, our Supreme Court. Germany, the basic law of Germany, establishes a federal parliamentary republic with a chancellor and a president alongside a constitutionally guaranteed set of basic rights. The con- and there's one in India. The Constitution of India establishes a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic with a pro- parliamentary system of government. But there was something, I think Attorney General Meese said that was... Or maybe he was a a former SCOTUS judge. I can't remember. I have the audio somewhere too. But essentially what he said was, you can have the best constitution ever created, which I believe ours is. I think the constitution the framers wrote for this country is the best document ever written. But it's only as good as the people that are elected to hold up that constitution. If you if you have a bunch of elected officials or a president or a Congress that completely subverts the Constitution, then that Constitution is nothing but a piece of paper. And that's what he said in a nutshell. I, it's, I'm just I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially what he said. And so this is what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of the left, you know, the people that say men can give birth, the people that, that are putting men in women's sports, the people that are essentially saying two plus two equals six. I'm afraid these people are going to infiltrate red states and try and change the very meaning of what this country is trying to convince people that this country is a democracy when in fact it's a constitutional republic and you could see this happening right now right in front of our face when they constantly come out on the media maga maga republicans are threats to democracy donald trump is a threat to democracy we must protect our democracy 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 like it is every literally it's like every sentence that you hear i can't tell you how many comments i get on my social media about how donald trump and his voters and and republicans are threats to democracy but when you ask these people what a democracy is they don't know they won't answer they really don't know what it is if these so what in other words what these people should be doing is they should be going to these blue states and reinforcing as they put it what a democracy is and how this country is not a democracy but a constitutional republic this is why i feel like they want to put their opponents in education camps and in fact i have audio very disturbing audio from paula collins this was leaked audio from a phone call that she was on or some type of some type of zoom meeting or something but this is exactly what i think they want to do like I said, they're, they're, they're a hive mind. They, this group think. This is why group think is so dangerous. And it's the stuff of totalitarians. But listen to this audio of Paula Collins talking about putting people in re-education camps. Here, check this out. In, in moving forward and moving through this, uh, even, if it's, even if we were to have a resounding blue wave come through, uh, as many of us would like, putting it all back together again after we've gone through this uh, MAGA nightmare and, and re-educating, basically, which that sounds like a rather um, <laughs> a re-education camp. I don't think we really want to call it that. I'm sure we can find another way to phrase it. Um, uh-huh. Anybody else care to talk about this? Ah, you see? You see how they do it? This was in a meeting, a Zoom meeting, out in the open. For I don't know where it was from. It was all social media. But this woman is a high-ranking government official talking about putting people in re-education camps because they think we're in this turbulent moment and that people are just mistaken. I'm serious. They, You just heard this woman talking about putting 
Trump voters in re-education camps, but calling it something different. But you see how they subvert the and weaponize the language? This is what they do. They are so good at it. This is what worries me about their so-called reinforcing democratic values. Trump voters have not changed. They are just regular patriotic Americans. You know, it's kind of hard to hate half of your fellow Americans, is it not? Did these people ever think that maybe they're wrong? Did they ever think that maybe Donald Trump is an innocent man? They're trapped in their own delusions. And it's becoming really dangerous because now they're acting on those delusions. They're tr- it's like they're stuck in this alternate reality that we're just going through a turbulent times right now because of Donald Trump. And once he's gone, then we're going to have to fix what was broken. I'm sorry, folks, but nobody has changed but these people. You know, the people that say men can give birth. The people, that's, the people that say this country is systemically racist. The people that want to take away your Second Amendment rights. The people that don't want free speech. I got another crazy, crazy article. You wanna, I, and, and I'm going to explain to you exactly how this happens. All right? And I saved this just for this, just for the show. Real quick, I'm not going to read the whole article. But let me see here. I wanted to get into the war thing, but we're going to have to save that tomorrow. Things are getting really crazy with the war. Um, this is an article from the New York Post, and it's fairly recent. And this is actually happening to another person, too. But this is the most recent one. And here's the title of the article. Florida driver accused of intentionally doing burnouts on LGBTQ pride crosswalk mural. So a Florida man is accused of intentionally doing multiple burnouts on an LGBTQ pride painted intersection with his truck earlier this month. And this came out February 14th of 24. Dylan Brewer, 19 years old, was caught on surveillance video in his lifted pickup truck with LED underbody lights and a flag attached to the back, revving his engine and making a hard left turn at the intersection on 2nd Avenue and Delray Beach. That's just 15 minutes from me. As the truck peeled out of the area, two curved tire marks were left behind as the smoke created by the spinning wheels dissipated in the air, according to the video released, but I'm not going to play the video because it's, this is audio only. So witnesses reported that Brewer was observed intentionally performing multiple burnouts with his vehicle on LGBTQ pride crosswalk. The, quote, reckless action caused significant damage to the streetscape painting, which serves as a symbol of unity and and inclusivity for the LGBTQ community. Man, I can't talk. Law enforcement investigators received multiple reports of Brewer's destructive acts, that's in quote, along with several witnesses proving providing cell phone video of the burnouts over a week-long investigation. Brewer turned himself in over to police on February 12th. Listen to this. He was charged with felony criminal mischief, damage to property over $1,000, and misdemeanor reckless driving. There it is, folks. Felony criminal mischief. He was released on a $5,000 bond just after midnight Tuesday. So this is where it gets crazy. This is where the left is incrementally trying to destroy people's First Amendment right. Okay, this is how they're trying to criminalize speech by essentially trying to turn every speech that they don't like into hate speech. Right here. You ready for this? Palm Beach County Human Rights Council said the vandalism should be considered a hate crime, according to the South Florida Sun Sentinel. The Delray Beach intersection mural was targeted in a similar stunt the day after it was unveiled on June 2021. That was the older story I was telling you about. Alexander Jarek was part of a birthday, President Donald Trump birthday rally, when he used his pickup to burn tire marks to burn tire marks into the new mural. He was originally arrested and charged with criminal mischief, reckless driving and evidence of prejudice, but had the latter charge dropped and recently finished his probation sentencing, according to the Sun Sentinel. In 2022, a similar rainbow design crosswalk in Atlanta was twice spray-painted with swastikas. During the height of the BLM protest, BLM mural painted outside of the Trump Tower in Midtown Manhattan was vandalized several times, including by a black woman who just live-streamed herself doing it 
in July 2020. So this is what I'm trying to say. They're trying to change this, fundamentally change this country by saying burning out on an LGBTQ crosswalk on a road is a hate crime, punish, which is a felony, punishable by a lot of time in prison. In fact, what is the charge? What is the sentence for a hate crime? You have the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act passed in 2009. This act expanded the federal definition of hate crimes to include crimes motivated by the victim's actual or perceived gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. It allows federal authorities to intervene in hate crime cases that local authorities cannot or will not prosecute. How much you want to bet this is going to happen to this kid in Florida? We don't know yet, but I guarantee the Biden administration's DOJ is going to come after this kid for federal hate crime laws, right? 18 U.S.C. subsection 245, this statute makes it a crime to interfere with an individual's federally protected activities, such as attending school, participating in public services, applying for employment, voting based on race, color, religion, or national origin. The 18 U.S.C. section 249 Hate Crimes Act, this statute criminalizes willfully causing bodily injury or attempting to do so with fire or a firearm or other dangerous weapon. When the crime is motivated by the victim's actual or perceived race, color, religion, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. The penalties for hate crime. So basic penalties is up to 10 years in prison. Enhanced penalties, which they're adding enhancements to the J6 protesters, the political prisoners. Up to life in prison. And don't get it twisted. How much you want to bet that Paula Collins, who was just on this audio, saying that Trump voters need to be re-educated. Do you think Paula Collins, if she was a judge or if she was the if she was the one overseeing this case with this burnout of the LGBT, how much you want to bet that she would send this person away to prison for life? This is what's happening, man. You have this type of ideology that's seeping into every orifice of our country, into our intel agencies, into our judicial system. Look at the case in New York City with Donald Trump, where they violated almost every single one of Donald Trump's constitutional rights, his right to due process, right to a fair trial, attorney-client privilege. Just go down the list. Just like the first, the the fifth, the sixth amendment, the eighth amendment, the tenth amendment, the fourteenth amendment. They have violated so many of Donald Trump's rights in that one case, all in the name of what? All in the name of ideology. All because they think Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. And so there you go. This ties it all in, man. This is... I hope I'm explaining myself. Sometimes I am very bad at this. I mean, I think I am anyways. I am really bad at just getting what I'm thinking out there. I should probably prepare myself a little bit better. But this is what's happening. So a kid does a burnout on a rainbow crosswalk in Florida. And these people want to charge him with a federal hate crime, right? Punishable by 10 years or even life in prison. And don't think they won't either. Look at what we're seeing to all the J6 protesters. And this is another thing. Like, Democrats don't realize, like, they don't see it as a red flag that you have all these Trump allies and Republicans being arrested all across the country. I mean, what are we up to now? Like 2,000 or 3,000? Like this, do you see any Democrats being targeted by Republicans? Do you see any Democrats being targeted? No, this is all happening by one side. Why? Because these people are totalitarians. And we did a whole show on why Democrats and why Democrats are turning this country into a totalitarian autocracy. And I think that this is how they do it. That to go all the way back, full circle, they're fundamentally changing the meaning of our country. The, they want to re-found America, right? This is what they're doing. When, Don, when, jo, when, uh, when Barack Obama came out and said, we're going to fundamentally change this country, this is it. This is how they're doing it. And they have really sneaky ways. They have the media. Now they apparently have the intel agencies. They have the health agencies and health institutions. They have the justice system. They have almost every single institution being utilized for their ideology, their ideologues. 
And they're, they're turning this country into something it's not. This is why you can't bridge the divide. is because the majority of Americans don't, they haven't changed. <laughs> this is, I think, the fundamental problem. If you really want to get it down, if you want to reduce it down to like bare bones, you have people, you have a small minority of people, which is the progressive left, you know, the, the Hamas supporting anti-Semites, the, the men can give birth. You have those people that truly do believe that the, everyone else has changed and that they must be re-educated and they must reinforce what democracy is. But that's just not true. People haven't changed. They still love this country just like they loved this country 50 years ago, 60 years ago. I mean, what is it that Republicans and Trump voters and, and Trump supporters, what are they doing that's so different than what they were doing 60 years ago or 70 years ago? Nothing. In fact, they've actually become more like Democrats. <laughs> and I've said this before, that the Republicans, the right, has actually slowly moved left, right? The whole country has moved left, but the left has went way left, like off the grid left. <laughs> and so now they want to bring... They think everyone else is just crazy, like everybody else has changed. No, dude, you all have changed. You are the ones that are saying men can give birth, putting women in men's sp- or putting men in women's sports. You know, this, this anti-Semitism that's running rampant, which is actually anti-America movement in this country. We've discussed that. And, and then you, they, they, they use people like Paula Collins to actually take action on their ideology, to say, listen. You're a threat to democracy, and so we're going to have to we're going to have to put you away for life. And you know what? I got to blame the media for all of this. And this is what brings me into I was doing a little research. I wanted to pull some quotes about how the framers felt about the media, how important our press was. I have all kinds of papers here, folks. I got so many topics and stuff to get into. So I'm going to read a quote. Quote Were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. You know who that was from? Thomas Jefferson. Mm Mm-hmm. How about this one? A popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy, or perhaps both. Knowledge will forever govern ignorance. And a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. You know who that was? James Madison. So in other words, informed people. If the people are going to be their own governors, if the people are going to govern themselves, then they must be informed with knowledge, up to date with everything that's going on. It is the only way. And unfortunately, what we have is a press, a media that has combined arms, has joined arms with the administrative state. And that exactly what you get is what we have. Our media has turned into a propaganda arm of the left wing progressives, of Democrats. And all these framers knew this. I mean, you could tell by their quotes exactly what they were talking about. So here's another one, quote, whoever would overthrow the liberty of a nation must begin by subduing the freeness of speech. Hmm. Which side is trying to get rid of free speech again? Which side is trying to turn every speech that they don't like into hate speech? Yes, that would be the left. And you know who that was? That was Benjamin Franklin. Warned against government control over the press. Huh. And then, I mean, the the list goes on. I did a bunch of research, but I'm not going to get into it right now. But that's the problem. If we had a press doing this instead of us podcasters, like, you know, folks, if it wasn't for our media sucking so bad and being a propaganda machine, I wouldn't even be here behind this microphone. If we, didn't, we never had a press like we do right now in this country. It is state-run media now. And unfortunately, we have millions of people that actually believe what they're saying, being propagandized. Now, you can say that this has been going on for a long time, and I believe it has. And only up until we had social media and full access to all the information in human history are people really starting to notice. I am a firm believer that the media has always been like this. They've always controlled the means of information and they would bend it and twist it however they wanted, you know, using the powers of the press to subdue their viewers like MSNBC, CNN, 
okay, weaponizing information like lying about Russia collusion, lying about masks, lying about uh, lying about everything. I mean, think of all the major issues the media has been wrong on. And it's not just them being wrong. What's actually the most damaging, I think, is their partnership with the federal government. That, ladies and gentlemen, is extremely dangerous. You see it. I see it. The framers seen it. They knew how important a free press was and a press that is for the people to push back against government, not partner with the government. And that is why you're seeing what we have in this information war. Then you have people like myself, you, obviously, you know, the ones that refuse to watch cable news like CNN, MSNBC, and then sometimes, I'll be honest, Fox News, you know, they're more broad. Um, but yeah, Fox is OK. But still, they, you know, they're more of the rhino establishment media. But it's us against the machine, folks, this machine that has been running things for 100 years as far as the media. Maybe not as far, maybe not 100 years, but certainly after World War II, uh, pretty close to 100 years. But it is us against them. And both sides have unlimited access to knowledge, except one side has a massive platform, is backed by federal agencies and the federal government, gets federal funding like NPR. And, and the list goes on. And then you have the other side that is putting up this fight, massive pushback. People like Russell Brand, Dan Bongino, just go down the list. You have Steve Bannon, you got Mark Levin. All these people have access to the same information. But they're actually protecting the people by informing them. Exactly how James Madison intended the press to be. And so this is why it seems like things are really crazy. But I promise you. If you still believe men cannot give birth, you are on the right side. But the problem is, is that they are really, really forcing the, the ideology down our throats. And they're trying to fundamentally change our country. And the way that they're doing it is they're like, screw it. If we can't convince these people, if we can't convince these people with our media apparatus anymore, we're just going to force them by incrementally trying to destroy the thing that's in our way, which is the Constitution, which protects us, by the way. It is a contract signed by, an, signed by our framers, signed by the government to protect the people, a country for the people and by the people, not for the government. <laughs> it, the government doesn't have a right to a speedy trial. It's the American people. It's the defendant. This is why the, the, and, and you have an entire party that worships government. That same party that worships government also worships the government's media, which is CNN, MSNBC, this is the battle we're up against. And these are the differences that, that I'm pointing out. These are the teams. And we're in this game of tug of war. And this is why the country's thrashing back and forth violently. But it's go somebody's going to win. <laughs> There's somebody's going to win. And I assure you, when it comes to the patriotic people in this country, you know, the people that do believe in the Second Amendment, well, guess what happens when the First Amendment just stops working? That's why the framers of this country gave the people the Second Amendment. Don't let these people fool you into thinking the Second Amendment's just for self-defense or just for hunting. No, the Second Amendment was clearly for the American people to defend themselves against a rising tyranny, period. And that is exactly what we're watching take place right now, is a totalitarian autocracy turning into a tyranny. And you're watching a tyrannical overtake of our government, its institutions, like the education, the health, the science, the, the intel agencies, and also the media. And this is what we're dealing with. And so you got two sides. And I assure you, if you still believe that men shouldn't be competing in women's sports, you're on the right side. Anyways, there is a lot of stuff that has happened that I want to get into real quick before we leave. Um, Joe Biden has approved more money to Ukraine during the G7 summit. Of course, you had Zelensky and his green, uh, the, his green army fatigues uh, with the handout looking for more tax dollars. But I actually broke down some numbers. And this is going to shock you. You ready for this? We've sent $113 billion in aid to Ukraine. You want to know what it could achieve here in the country? Homelessness. So the $113 billion, if you... If you attributed $113 billion towards homelessness, it would only take $20 billion a year to completely solve the homeless crisis for five years. 
with the money we sent to Ukraine. <laughs> oh, it gets worse. You could fund nearly three years of comprehensive of affordable housing support, an estimated $40 billion annually, which means you could give everybody, every homeless person in this country a house for $40 billion a year. <laughs> you ready for this one? Health care. While $113 billion would only cover a fraction of the estimated $300 to $400 billion annual cost for universal health care, it could significantly support spe specific health care initiatives like expanding Medicaid or funding health programs. Yeah. So essentially, exactly what the left wants is free health care with the money that we sent to Ukraine. This is just the money we sent to Ukraine. How about this one? It would cost $5.52 billion to replace the homes destroyed by the wildfires in Hawaii. This $113 billion could replace those homes over 20 times. <laughs> Nuclear power plants, energy. $113 billion could build approximately 11 nuclear power plants. Think about that. 11 nuclear power plants in this country producing electricity. Do you know do you know how much electricity would be? This is what this is what should piss people off. I am no I, listen, I'm no fan of Putin. I'm not a, a Putin sympathizer. I'm not a Ukraine sympathizer. I am anti-war. Period. And what I see taking place in Russia and Ukraine with this disaster that Joe Biden has caused because of his weakness and fecklessness is costing the American people decades of their future and just the money we're sending over there, not to mention the lives that are impacted, the hundreds of thousands of people's lives gone forever. Ukraine is damn near about ready to wipe out an entire generation of, of people over there to this war. And all I'm saying is, is during the Trump administration, you didn't have to worry about this stuff. We were not dealing with this stuff. And the $113 billion that the American taxpayer has spent over in Ukraine could achieve all of the left and the right's dreams with just the piece of money that we sent over to Ukraine. 11 nuclear power plants. I mean, that would bring down people's electric bills tenfold. We'd be paying like $40 a month for our electric bills. <laughs> but no, we're, it's, it's the exact opposite. Road construction. So the $113 billion could build approximately 22,600 miles of highway at $5 million per mile, which is actually quite a lot. So, you know, these are conservative, these are conservative estimates. So 22,600 miles of highway. How many people out there think we can use some new roads? Maybe rebuild the roads we, the, rebuild the roads we already have, some highways, some bridges maybe? Yeah, well, the money we sent to Ukraine could build... 22,600 miles of brand new highway. It could also build approximately 5,650 bridges across the country at $20 million per bridge. It could fund the comprehensive cleanup and rebuilding of Flint's water system multiple times over. Yeah, so the Flint, the Michigan water problem is going to cost about $450 million to fix. And we just sent $113 billion to Ukraine in the last two years. You ready for this? Desalination plants. So the $113 billion could build approximately 113 large desalination plants at an estimated cost of $1 billion per plant. So they would pretty much solve the water crisis across the country, places like California. In 2020, the United States spent approximately $370 billion on, pres on prescription drugs. The $113 billion could cover, co could cover around 30% of the annual cost of prescription medications for all Americans. Think about that. Could buy 30% of the prescription medications of all Americans. This is how much money we've sent over to Ukraine. And here the American people are struggling, paying double for energy paying double for their groceries. And this guy just sent, I don't know, another $200 million over to Ukraine. We're at $113 billion. That is not to mention the money that they're sending over there that they don't tell us about, which I guarantee you is another probably $100 billion, if not more. 
So think about that. By the time this war is over, 10 years from now, hopefully sooner when Donald Trump gets elected. But if we allow these constant, endless wars to go on forever and ever, the American people won't have a country anymore. I mean, you look at videos right now of downtown Detroit. You look at videos of of Seattle, downtown Seattle. It freaking looks like something out of, of Gotham City, man, in a Batman movie. I mean, you got like dumpsters on fire, people huddle around a trash can that they, they caught a fire in. You got like little uh, trash burning on the side of the road, tents, cardboard boxes, people sleeping all over the place, just bodies everywhere across the streets. I mean, it looks like something out of a movie. I mean, it looks like an apocalypse. And here we are sending $113 billion to Ukraine. And so this is something very important to me. I don't like war. I think that is the one thing I praise Donald Trump for the most out of all the things that this man has done. And there's been a lot that great things that he did. I mean, the list is, is a mile long. One of the most things I appreciate out of the Trump administration was no new wars. For the first time in my life, this country was actually brokering peace across the entire world. And more notably, the Middle East, which is almost impossible. And within two months of this new administration coming into office, we find ourselves in all these other foreign conflicts, spending hundreds of billions of dollars. And let me tell you, it's great. It's great for the weapons defense contractors. It's, it's great for Boeing and Lockheed Martin and, and, and Northrop Grumman and all these you know, contractors. But what about the American people, man? How about you give them some, some nuclear power plants? How about you give them some housing? How about you fix the homeless crisis for $20 billion? And here we are just spitting money out. Like a, and, and, the, and the thing is, it's because it's not their money. It's always easier to spend other people's money. It's like going grocery shopping for a friend with their credit card. Are you going to be looking out for the best deals? Are you going to be shopping for the best product and doing research as if it was your own money? No. And this is the same thing we have. And, and Democrats, their solution to the problem is by increasing taxes, you know, tax the rich, this whole tax the rich. But what they don't realize in their ignorance is that the rich already pay almost half of all the tax revenue. Okay, you can't tax them anymore without them what? Drastically increasing the prices of their products. The rich elite, I'm sorry, but they're job producers. They make jobs. They do a lot more than what the Democrats think. They're very anti-elite. And although I do partially agree with them, I think that the wealthy should pay their fair share. I also feel like the better solution would be just to stop spending money. All right. This this is not a income problem. This is a spending problem that we have. And I'm sorry, but this administration is awful at it. This Congress is awful at it. Republicans are just as bad as Democrats when it comes to the military aid. All right. Now, I admit Republicans aren't as bad when it comes to, let's just say, social spending like the Green New Deal and stuff, but they're still bad. They still put this country in 35 trillion worth of debt. And Donald Trump was the only president I've ever seen that actually brought peace and prosperity to this country, something the American people desperately need. And I'm sorry, but to go all the way back to the first topic and just wrap it all up into this bow, how can we bridge this divide? When you have the other side that has a completely different vision for the future of this country, completely different. I mean, they don't even think this country is great anymore. I mean, they say they like, they like the flag, but come on, folks. I see this stuff on social media. These people come out with these memes saying that, you know, that, that Republicans, you can, you can tell who a Republican is by the flags that they fly in their front yard. Like it is straight up gaslighting. Everybody knows in 2024 that you can tell who is a Democrat and who's a Republican, just whether they're flying a flag or not. That is the truth. If you, ha- if you come up to a house and there's a flag flying in their front yard, they are 99.9% likely to be a Trump supporter or a Republican. Democrats just do not like this country. I'm sorry. This is not the Democrat Party of old anymore. And trust me, if I thought that the Republicans were that bad, I wouldn't be voting for these people. I'm not a Republican. I am a constitutional conservative. I I support Donald Trump. Yes. And when Republicans get as bad as the Democrats, then I'll stop voting for them too. 
But right now, the Democrats are not the, the old Democratic Party. They are not the party of JFK anymore. These people have been completely overtaken by the left. And there's, I mean, you can just go down the list of reasons why that is. You can go down the list of examples of why I say that. So it's, listen, this was just something that was on my mind and I was reading that New York Times article and it clicked in. I know everybody wants unity in this country. The only way to unite this country is by prosperity. Prosperity brings unity. That's it. Disparity brings division. When people are desperate, they do desperate things, man. They treat people like crap. They, they, everybody's trying to screw each other over for money. Prosperity brings unity. And so I agree with Donald Trump when he says he's going to unify this country through his success. And that is exactly the right mindset to have. When you bring prosperity to this country, you will see unity. I guarantee it. It's in our nature, man. People don't like division. People don't like at each other's throats all the time. And so with the New York Times and these NGOs and these nonprofits, what they should be doing is figuring out ways to bring prosperity to these states, not trying to brainwash them into thinking that this country is a democracy, into thinking this country is something that it isn't. We are a constitutional republic, not a democracy. And so I, I just find it so rich when these people say that, you know, Trump voters are threats to democracy. And these people don't even know what a democracy is. And what's terrifying is that people like Paula Collins wanting to put Trump voters in re-education camps to reinforce that we are a democracy. And if you don't think so, then maybe you should go to a re-education camp. <laughs> so I don't know, man. That is, I just wanted to share my thoughts with you. That's what I was thinking about today. There's a lot of stuff going on. I have so much other stuff to get into, and I'm going to on the next show. Uh, maybe I can run through some things real quick in the last few minutes here. Um, what the next episode? I definitely want to get into the illegal immigrants voting in this this upcoming election. This is a real thing that's happening. I think we're starting to see the Democrats' plan play out, which is getting illegal immigrants to vote. There's a reason why they opened the southern border like this. There's no, I mean, we knew this from the very beginning. From the very beginning, I had to ask myself, okay, what is their motive behind this? Okay, there's no reason to do this other than cheat in the election, other than getting these people to turn in a ballot. And that's exactly what I think they're going to do. And if we don't get ahead of this, GOP, Laura Trump, if we do not get ahead of this, or is it Laura Trump? I can't remember. I, I know it's, it's not Laura. I don't think it's, it's pronounced something different. Anyways head of the RNC chair, if we do not get ahead of this, then we're going to be in the same predicament we were in 2020. The media is going to call us election deniers. They're going to say we never accept any election, when in reality, it's these people that continuously cheat and use lawfare in order to win elections by, I don't know, changing states' election laws against its own constitution illegally. Okay, that's the kind of stuff that happened. You know, uh, illegal mail-in ballots with no signature verification, lowering the signature verification threshold, that kind of stuff. Illegally changing state election laws against their own constitution. That's what happened. That's what you call rigging an election, right? You don't need mass voter fraud. You don't need widespread voter fraud. All you need is specific voter fraud in specific locations. Surgical voter fraud is what I call it. And you do that by going to key swing states, getting 10,000 here, 10,000 here, 10,000 here. Next thing you know, Joe Biden wins the election. If you call it that, Joe Biden, quote unquote, wins the election by 42,000 votes in four states. That Because that's exactly what happened in 2020. And I'm afraid that their next strategy is going to be flooding the country with tens, maybe even 20, 20 million illegal immigrants and every single one that they allow into this country, in some cases, flying them in giving them voter registration forms and teaching them and, and showing them how to vote and how to register to vote. We have this problem, folks, and I think it's a real issue people need to start getting into. And I have audio. I'm going to prove it. There was, a, a, uh, there was a, a government official in Alabama that has come out and said that the Biden administration is using government institutions as a massive get out to vote effort, uh, a, a get out the vote machine. We talked about this about a month ago. We got to get on this. Keep drilling it, drilling it, drilling it until people start doing something about it. All we can do is talk about it, man. We can't fix these issues. It has to be from the RNC, the GOP, our congressmen and women. It has to be them. We can't do anything about it. All we could do is call it out. And that's what we're going to do. 
And so, there, so that's what I want to get into the next show. I don't have time to get into it right now. We've already went way over time. But that's definitely a topic I want to get into on the next show. This is going to be a big topic all week, and it should be for the all the way from here to the election. Um, another one is, is Joe Biden going to be the nominee? I, ladies and gentlemen, I just don't know how to answer this question. I am right down the middle on this. In a way, Joe Biden is extremely stubborn. That is a common attribute of Joe Biden that we've heard from multiple different people that surround him, that he's a very old, stubborn man. And I'm sorry, but it looks like Jill Biden is just liking the president. The She just likes being the first lady way too much. She likes the commodities. She likes the luxuries, flying on Air Force One. I think she is worse than Joe Biden in some ways because she should not be allowing her husband to put himself through this. And how much do you honestly love the country if you're willing to put yourself above the country? You know what I mean? Like, I want to be I want Air Force One. I want to stay in the White House, even though Joe Biden is a completely dementia ridden fool that is destroying this country. It's all about me. That I mean, a shame on her for putting her husband through this. I think the focus needs to be a lot on her. She needs to get some of the blame for this. This should have never happened to this country. She should not be allowing Joe Biden to run. However, Joe Biden is a stubborn man, so I don't see him dropping out. On the other hand, I really don't see how Joe Biden gets through this election, man. I really don't. We're going to find out in these debates. We're going to find out what's going on. I still think Donald Trump should... He should demand a drug screen from Joe Biden's uh, campaign. I, I mean, I do. I do. Do I? I'm not joking. I'm not being hyperbolic like Joe Biden. It's the truth, man. No, no, I'm serious. No joke. No joke. No, I think I think Joe Biden should have a a drug screen. I think they put him on some type of performance enhancing drug to do these these uh, debates. And especially during the the State of the Union, that guy looked like he was he looked like he was high on meth, man. The guy he did not pause and take a breath for almost thirty minutes, folks. The guy, I, listen, I don't know what they got him on. I'm sure it's probably something crazy, being how it's the president of the United States. It's probably some crazy, insane like designer drug or test drug that they're creating in in some lab somewhere. Who knows, man? It's the federal government. I imagine they got some pretty crazy stuff. Um, but on the other hand, I totally see Democrats. Democrats are wigging out about Joe Biden. I got an article from Politico where this guy just unleashes holy hell on the Democrats. Uh, I mean, he is essentially, I mean, you want to talk about negative Ned, <laughs> this guy, man. I'm going to read this article. You're going to be like, man, this guy's a Democrat. Yeah, he's putting it to the Democratic Party. He's like, listen, these people don't even know how bad this is. And he's just like, I'm going to sit to the side and, and take a drink during the election because this is going to be a nightmare. Uh, but I have that article I want to go through from Politico. Uh, Doug Burgum. This is, Doug Burgum's been a big talk of the town the last week. Uh, he's been pretty popular. Kevin O'Leary has come out and endorsed uh, Doug Burgum. He is the governor of North Dakota, I'm pretty sure. North Dakota. Listen, I don't really know the guy. He seems pretty rock solid to me. And... You know what? I'll just go ahead and play the audio of Kevin O'Leary on his endorsement of Doug Burgum. Here, check this out. Very few Americans know that the richest citizens in the country for sovereign wealth are people that live in North Dakota. Doug Burgum did that. You wish living in California, New York, anywhere else that Burgum was vice president and did that for your constituency. He really took that state to the top of the pecking order. That's execution skills. That's what a governor does. They're the CEO of a state. So I'm a huge advocate for him. And I'd love to see Trump bring him in to the portfolio. I'll tell you why. Trump himself admitted that in his last tenure, his last mandate, he made some mistakes on who he brought into cabinet. Bergam is not a mistake. Bergam could be the get it done guy. You know, Trump is bombastic. He's the vision guy. But he needs execution skills. He could say to Bergam, go fix the border, go fix energy, go fix anything. That's what Bergam does. I don't see that skill set proven in any other candidate. So I'm, I'm unabashedly supporting someone I know in business as a phenomenal leader. All right. I'll give it to him. He's right. I, there is no proven candidate on there of getting things done. And Kevin O'Leary is also right about we need a fighter. We need somebody that's going to get in there. And start busting some heads, man. I'm start and start getting stuff done instantly. 
We need, like, the VP needs to be more like a partnership, almost like splitting the presidency in half. Donald Trump, you take this half of the field, you go take this half of the battlefield. And that's how they need to treat this presidency, because four years is not a lot of time, folks. Not a lot of time at all. To fix the level of damage this administration has caused to this country, it's going to take at least a generation. But we could get a big chunk of it done in four years if Donald Trump picks the right VP and picks a partner. All right. Not some ceremonial guy that's just there to to be in the background. No. I don't really know Doug Burgum. That's my only problem with that. I've done a little bit of research. In fact, uh, you know what? I don't have time to read his background and stuff. I did have it. I don't know. Look in the Doug Burgum. I've been reading about him. I don't really have anything negative to say about him. He's never really came out and said anything bad about Donald Trump. He's always supported Donald Trump unless there's something I'm missing. I don't know. Maybe the, he is good for VP. I just feel like it's being pushed really hard by Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful here. And so that's what kind of makes me kind of leery. But I don't know. I posted this poll on my social media. And as of right now, out of think, I think of like 2,000 people, 73% of people say yes, Doug Burgum would be a good pick for VP. That's actually quite surprising. Um, I was thinking of J.D. Vance. And in fact, I am still saying somebody, I, I'm still saying J.D. Vance is in all likely going to be the, the vice president unless we go through my initial theory, which is still my theory. I'm still going strong with it. Ron DeSantis. I think a Ron DeSantis, Donald Trump administration would decimate all. It would bring in even moderate Democrats on board with a Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump presidency. But you would push. I mean, it would a, a DeSantis Trump presidency would be a steamroller, man. When you want to talk about getting things done, that's a that's a good team. And he would bring in the Nikki Haley's. He would bring in the the rhinos. He would bring in a lot of people. But again, when you look at statistics in the past, the vice president never really made a big impact on elections. People don't vote for a president based off who their VP is a little bit. Yeah. But is it a big, huge contributing factor? Not really. But again, when you're talking about elections that are coming down to 12,000, 15,000 votes across three or four different states, you want everything you can get. And this is why Donald Trump's going to libertarian conventions. This is why he's going to Brooklyn This or the, the Bronx. This is why he's going to bodegas. This is why he's going to New Jersey. He's going to all these places. He's going to the hood. Donald Trump was praised by a pastor yesterday. I actually have audio of that. Donald Trump was praised by a pastor yesterday for actually going to the hood and giving these people a seat at the table. Here, check this out. President Trump, I'm so humble that you would be here. President Obama never came to the hood, so to speak, right? <laughs> President Joe Biden, he went to the big NAACP dinner, but he never came to the hood. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Pastor. Very humble. Really nice. Thank you. My honor. Yeah. So that's what Donald, and he needs to. I think Donald Trump, as hard as it is, he needs to go everywhere. Go everywhere, man. There is a lot of people out there that are urging. That there's a lot of people out there itching to get somebody else in office after this Joe Biden disaster. Go out to the hood. Go out, go out everywhere. Go to the Bronx. Go to the bodegas. Continue doing what you're doing, man. And I'm telling you, you're going to see a wave you're going to see a landslide election like we've never seen before. Um, some interesting comments off of that, that article, off of that post, by the way. I actually had one woman, I had one person talk about the hood, like talking about the name. And it was actually quite an interesting conversation. Um, uh, she said terms like the hood and ghetto need to go away. I'm like, OK, they kind of piqued my interest. And, I, you know, I'm open minded about a lot of things. I like seeing both sides to everything, folks. And so I dug in a little bit. I said, I don't know what else you would call it. Economic disadvantaged neighborhood. <laughs> uh, hood and ghetto have been used for ages. It would be tough to change it. And that, you know, I'm right. How do you change a, how do you change a word or a phrase? It's just not that easy. Um, and then she replied with, don't you think those terms are racially biased? And this person said, how can they be? How can they be when people of all races live in them? Whether it's the hood, a slum, the ghetto, a holler, it don't matter what color you are, it's just where poor people live. The Irish immigrants is why the hood and ghetto was termed. 
yeah, a really, really good conversation we were having. Um, and this person said, I could care less to argue over something that never really mattered to me. I don't know what that means. These are all new comments I haven't read yet. You cared enough to comment. Sorry if you don't like the answer that I provided you. She replied with, I love your answer. And this person put, J. Cool put, the Democrats that created them must go away first. <laughs> savage, man, savage. Uh, she put, this is not a joke. I'm just trying to say that it's words like that that keep the R word active. Whoa, where'd the R word come from? Kind of weird. It's our job. It's our job to keep striving and driving forward. This sounds like a leftist. I'm not going to lie. It sounds like a lefty, but she's a follower of mine. So I don't know. I don't know if she's a lefty or not. And I put, I agree with you somewhat, but I don't know how we could change language like that. And this next person, the one that said that the Democrats are creating them, said, I wasn't laughing. It's actually quite sad. So please tell me what we are supposed to call it. Shangri-La? <laughs> Listen, man, I have the best supporters. I have the best followers on social media out of everyone. They are extremely smart. Um, I, I just thought that was interesting to share with you. But yeah, Donald Trump going to the hood. That was a black pastor at a, in, in Detroit, Michigan, no less. These people are coming out all across the globe, all across the country. These conversations are happening. That Donald Trump was actually a good president. Compared to Joe Biden, Donald Trump was a great president. And listen, Donald Trump was the best president in my lifetime. That's all I can say. I, I, I've thought about this a, a thousand times. Donald Trump is the best president I have seen in my lifetime. I wasn't really around during Reagan, but we weren't living in the times we're living in now. You know, it's like we're living in very different times. Like even back then, Democrats still loved America. We don't have that now. We live in a very, very weird, weird time, a very divisive time, a very um, a time where information and knowledge is key, is power. We're in an information war, a culture war, a war on free speech, a war on religion. We just weren't going through all those things back then during the Reagan days. And so I think in, in a way, Donald Trump is better than Reagan. And we're just in better, we're in different times. But he's certainly the best president in my lifetime. Um, so anyways, that's happening right now. I'm, I'm sitting here trying to go through all the stuff that I can think of. So you got Doug Burgum, VP, no VP. Listen, the poll of my followers out of 2000 or so said that Doug Burgum is a 73% yes. That's actually quite interesting. I never would have guessed Doug Burgum. But hey, I still say DeSantis may come out late. They would be a powerhouse. I like J.D. Vance. Uh, he's another fighter that I, I think could split the battlefield up with Donald Trump. Doug Burgum, maybe I just don't really trust the guy because I don't really know him. You know what I mean? I haven't really done a huge bunch of, I haven't done a bunch of research on him. He is a multimillionaire. He's, he created his own wealth from a software business that he started back in the day. So I don't know. Very successful businessman. Obviously, Mr. Wonderful, Kevin O'Leary says he can get things done. Maybe. I don't know. So, but I still think it's going to be J.D. Vance. Don't hold me to that. But I wish it was Governor Ron DeSantis. That would be, that would be a pipe dream, I think. Uh, the, the pure powerhouse. Anyways, the attacks on the Supreme Court. This is something that I think my listeners need to pay attention on. The reason why this has been happening for months now, this attack on the Supreme Court has been happening for months against Alito lately with the whole flag conversation, the whole flag, the whole flag confrontation. And then uh, with Clarence Thomas, it's been a nonstop t attack against Clarence Thomas. It's it's the, all the conservative justices on the court. All right. We've seen what they did to Kavanaugh, absolutely disgraceful and disgusting what they did to that man in front of his family. Just disgusting. Is it surprising? No, because it's the Democrats. It's just disgusting. The character assassinations, everything the Democrats do is just so shameful, man. Anyways, I didn't want to focus too much on this because it gives the story legitimacy. I don't want people legitimizing this attack on the Supreme Court because it does it does delegitimize the court itself. And so I didn't want to do a story on it. I didn't want to do a show on it, but they're not stopping. And so we're going to have to bring this up and talk about it. I wanted to talk about Justice Sotomayor's staff, Ju Justice Sotomayor and her conflicts of interest that she has so that my listeners on social media call this stuff out. 
I uh, have this article from NPR about how Justice Sotomayor's staff urged schools and libraries to buy her memoir or kids' books, essentially using taxpayer money to force schools and libraries to buy her memoir. She made something like $3.8 million off of this. And you want to talk about Alito having a conflict of interest? (laughs) This is, again, the hypocrisy from the left knows no bounds, man. But the reason why they're targeting the courts, I think, is obvious. is because they know that there's huge decisions coming up in the court in the next few weeks and the next few months with this immunity ruling that they're obviously going to give the presidential immunity to Donald Trump, which is going to completely destroy the D.C. case. That's going to destroy Jack Smith in that case. And so literally all they have is this case from Alvin Bragg in New York, which is also something I wanted to get into a little bit deeper. Um, this case is going to get turned over, folks. It is almost a, a mathematical certainty. I would, I would wager extremely large sums of money and guarantee that this case will get turned over, but not until after the election. This is exactly what they're planning. This is why they brought this. The timing is everything on this case. This is also the reason why I don't think they're going to throw him in jail. If they throw him in jail, it's going to force an emergency appeal to the Supreme Court. They don't want that. They know this case is going to get reversed the moment it steps foot inside of a Supreme Court. They know it's going to get reversed. They don't want this thing reversed before the election. And so this is why I don't think they're going to sentence him to jail or throw him in jail. They may sentence him to jail, but he's not going to serve the time. He's not going to actually go to jail uh, before the election because they know this is going to force an emergency appeal. These people are ruining our elections. They're interfering in our federal elections by weaponizing the justice system against political opponents like we're living in Brazil or Venezuela or Ecuador. We don't do that stuff here. This is completely un-American. Unfortunately, the left, the same people that are trying to destroy the First Amendment right and your Second Amendment, who destroyed Donald Trump's due process, violated his, his right to a fair trial, these same people are telling you your threats to democracy. Yeah, imagine that. They are in complete denialism. They, I actually, believe it or not, I posted a video about this on TikTok that actually went viral. Um, And this person had the audacity, this person had the audacity to say that what happened to Donald Trump was not political and that Republicans are just making it seem like it's all about Democrats and Democrats are behind it. I'm like, excuse me? You mean to tell me that this case that was brought by a Democrat Attorney General, uh, a Democrat district attorney, Alvin Bragg, who campaigned on getting Donald Trump, prosecutes Donald Trump in a Democrat city with a Democrat judge and a in a Democrat stronghold that voted 84 percent for Democrats. You mean to tell me that Democrats aren't behind this? Of course they are. These people, I don't know, though, are they willfully ignorant or do you think they just really believe what they say? Do you think they actually believe that this has nothing to do with politics and that this was just justice being played out? This is the part I am stuck on. Part of me wants to believe that these people are are being naive purposely, that, you know, they're in denialism, essentially. But another part of me is like, man, I mean, it's like they truly, genuinely believe that the case that happened in New York City wasn't political and that it was actually real justice that happened to Donald Trump and that Politics had nothing to do with it. I mean, you can't be that naive to believe something like that. So that's why I I almost kind of believe that they know what they're saying is is a lie. The willfully ignorant, they're being willfully ignorant. They know that it's it's rigged. They know that it was weaponized. They know it was a show trial, but they accept it because they are desperate to win an election. They're in denialism. But they're only in denialism because they know this is the only way they can win. And I'm sorry, but it's it's just un-American. It's not going to work. But unfortunately, it's not going to get reversed until after the election. This, I think, we need to focus the most on. Rub these people's noses in it. Let them know that this is a show trial. This is not justice. And this is election interference. And you know how I feel about the whole thing. I said every single one of these people, including the judge, including Alvin Bragg, need to be investigated after Donald Trump wins, needs to be investigated and charged. 
for interfering in a federal election and violating people's civil rights, their voting rights. The essentially the exact same thing they're, they're charging Donald Trump with. That's what these people need to be investigated for. That's how I feel about it. I know some of my audience aren't as uh, savvy on the retribution era, uh, the the retribution side of things. But you know what? Sometimes the only way these people are going to learn is through accountability. But how you do that, you got to be very careful when you do it. And, And listen, part of me is like, listen, you can't. The only way you're going to unite this country is by doing the opposite of what you think you should do. So in other words, our human instinct is to get revenge, is to get retribution. But is it the right thing to do? And when you come up to tough situations like this, you know, and I've said this many, many times on the show, when you come to tough situations like the situations like this, always ask yourself, what would the framers of this of this country do? Well, to be honest, I think they would do exactly what Donald Trump said he's going to do, which is beat these people through prosperity, beat these people through his success. And then just like my wife says, she's a firm believer in the accountability route, which is these people need to be held accountable or they're never going to stop. And I, and I find myself right in the middle, very undecided on how to handle this situation. Let me know what you think. Send me an email, stephentoriellishow at gmail.com or leave me a comment on my social media. Let me know how you feel. Should Donald Trump get retribution? Should he hold these people accountable or should he not forgive them? But in a way, unite the country through success and prosperity rather than retribution and vengeance. I don't know. Let me know what you think. I kind of find myself right smack dab in the middle. I don't really know how to handle this. So I want to know how you think we should move forward and handle this situation. Will they stop if Donald Trump turns this country into, you know, peace and prosperity again? Or do you think they're just going to continue on the during the next Republican candidate during the next election? I don't know. It's it's you know they're not going to stop. So how do you fix it, man? I I really don't know. It's a tough one. Um, but yeah, that's a lot of the major stuff that has happened. I'm glad I got into it. It took me a half hour to do it, but those really are the major stories. Well, other than the nuclear sub and four warships off the coast of Florida, forty. I think it's like maybe fifty miles from me right now, where I'm sitting, where there's warships and a nuclear submarine, a Russian nuclear submarine. They are stationed in Cuba. What are they doing there? Um, all the all the intel agencies like Blinken and and what what is his name Kirby? These people that have no business being in the positions that they're in and actually should be fired for getting us into these predicaments. These people are telling us, "Oh, it's just nothing. It's just common. It's like it's so in your face, blatant lies." Oh, it's just you know. They're just training. They're just training exercises, right? (laughs) It's like exactly what they tell us in the movies. Oh, it's just a training exercise. That's all. You know, go back to your house. Go back in. Nothing to see here. And then, you know, like Men in Black, where they tell you to stare in this little thing. It's like, wait a minute, though. Like, we got four Russian warships and a Russian nuclear submarine docked in Cuba, and you expect the American people to just, what, ignore it? No. I mean, it's so crazy that these people, they think the American people are so dumb, man. Uh, No, I think that's actually a big deal. I think the American people have a right to be a little concerned about these warships over in Cuba. I don't know. Does the Cuban Missile Crisis ring any bells? And I don't know about you, but I think Joe Biden is the last, the absolute last person on the face of the earth I want in power dealing with another Cuban Missile Crisis. (laughs) I'm just going to go ahead and throw that out there. I don't want this guy anywhere near a Cuban Missile Crisis sequel. There's no way. I mean, we'll, we'll all be gone. We'll be goners, man, if this guy's in charge of that situation. And, you know, the problem is, is we don't know who's in charge, do we? It's not Blinken. It's not, it's not Kirby. It's certainly not Joe Biden. Is it Obama? Is it Lisa Monaco? Who, who exactly is running our country? That, I think, is the most shocking question for a lot of Americans, the left and the right. So there you go. There's our, there is our purpose for unity. There is a bridge for the divide. Who is running our country? I think we can all pretty much agree that the American people should know who's running our country. Don't you think? Like, I think that is some common ground. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe Democrats don't care. Maybe they don't. They're, they are ideologues. They are totalitarians. They, st- they have that hive mind, that groupthink. 
So it doesn't really matter to them who runs the country just so long as whatever it is or whoever it is is pushing their agenda and pushing their ideology onto the people. So maybe they maybe that's not a, maybe that's not a bridge for the divide. Uh, maybe I'm wrong on that one. Maybe they just don't care. I don't know about you, and but I definitely like to know who's running our country because whoever it is, listen, it's uh, it's it's not going good. Whoever it is needs fired. And as of right now, that's the president. And that's another thing. Like, Democrats are trying to convince everybody to vote for Joe Biden. But Joe Biden isn't even the one running the country. So what exactly, how exactly does that work again? You know, this is the, this is the logic we're having to deal with with these people, man. It's so out of this world, just crazy, man. We live in, in crazy times, y'all. <laughs> we are living in some crazy times, man. I, I just, it's sometimes it's a little overwhelming, a little mind boggling. It's a little like, I don't know, man. It, it's so, so crazy. You got to pinch yourself. It's like, am I dreaming? Like, are these people really pushing for men to go into women's bathrooms? What? Like, what is wrong with these people, man? And then you got to step back and kind of get a 10,000 foot view and just be like, all right, it's not the majority of Americans. So we're good there. They are just the loudest. And that's that's it. But they are starting to get control of our education system and our intel agencies and our government institutions and all the other stuff that are elections. So it's like, OK, now now you're really starting to uh, you're starting to get a little you're starting to get a little bigger than I want there starting to get a little bit more control than I think we're wanting. Um, so anyways, yeah, I think people should be the concerned with what's going on with, with the Cuban Missile Crisis 2 over there uh, happening right now, uh, 100 miles off the coast of Florida. That is, I mean, pretty un, it's pretty insane how we've gotten to this point in just three and a half years, isn't it? I mean, if you think about it, do you think... You know, I don't think you could be this bad on accident, folks. This is why I say, like, I'm a firm believer. I think all this stuff is purposeful. I mean, think about this. Would you do anything different if you were trying to destroy America? Would you do anything different than what Joe Biden is doing right now to this country? Not really. I mean, yeah, maybe you can, you know, adjust the order of things a little bit. But I'm telling you right now, if you were to destroy the United States of America, you wouldn't do things much different than what Joe Biden has done open the borders, get us involved in foreign conflicts, expend our military surplus, deficit spending, tank the economy, I mean, issue mandates, cause distrust and credibility in the justice system, in the elections. It's like, whoa, man, like this is exactly how you would topple a, a society. This is exactly how you would topple a country is exactly what we're watching here. So um, for the, I think that's about all the major news that's come out in the last, in the last, I don't know, in the last three or four days, I think we've pretty much touched on everything. Um, I will get a little bit more into depth on the next episode, even though it's, you know, information's coming out like a fire hose. So it's, I'm sure there's going to be five more hot topics that we need to get into. Um, but for the most part, you got Democrats freaking out about Joe Biden, the Cuba missile crisis two happening over there. Uh, a hundred miles off the coast of Florida, you got you got Joe Biden using the federal government as a massive get out the vote effort, which we talked about this in more depth in a, uh, about three episodes ago. Uh, they're using the federal agencies to what to register illegal aliens to to vote. That's an issue to me, but that's actually happening. I think is a big deal. We need to po focus on um, the 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 attacks on the Supreme Court. Everyone needs to be reminded about Sotomayor and her conflicts of interest in making three point four or three point eight million dollars by forcing uh, forcing libraries to buy her books. I think that's kind of a conflict of interest, don't you? If we're going to talk about ethics here, I think that's kind of. I mean, it's pretty pretty obvious, and I, I just find it so baffling that these people can talk about ethics. That Joe Biden can talk about ethics and talk about anybody having classified documents. Like it's the hypocrisy, the double standard, the 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 massive two-tier justice system, the hypocrisy we're witnessing is like it's off the charts, man. The gaslighting, the amount of gaslighting and propaganda we're seeing is mind-blowing. 
for Joe Biden to come out and, and talk about somebody being, you know, unethical is insane. Dude, you are prosecuting your political opponents by using the justice system, you moron. How can you come out and talk to anybody about ethics? It's just so crazy, man. We're going through this stuff. Anyways, all right, that is by far the longest episode we've ever done. No commercial breaks, no nothing. Straight hour and 40 minutes of getting into the nitty gritty of the latest news and culture and politics. So much stuff we got into today. Uh, hopefully, Hopefully I explained it well. Hopefully you guys are up to date with what is going on. And if you like this type of format, let me know. If you like longer format shows that just dive into multiple different topics, let me know. I don't really have a problem doing this long of a show. It is a little bit more time consuming, but if I only have to do two or three shows a week, then that's different. Maybe we can try and switch it up a little bit. Instead of trying to get one out every day, we can just do three two-hour shows three days a week. Maybe we'll try that. But let me know what you think. Send me an email. Stephen Torriello Show at gmail.com. If you want to support the show, please, you can download the podcast on all podcast platforms, wherever you get your podcast, iHeart, Spotify, Apple, whichever one, just type in my name, Stephen with the V, Torriello, T-A-U-R-I-E-L-L-O, download the show, leave a five-star review, also leave a comment, let me know how you like the show, and also follow the show on social media. I am extremely active on TikTok, Facebook, Twitter. I'm active on all social media, more mainly TikTok. That's where all my my creative content goes because um, I was actually accepted into the MAGA War Room campaign, uh, which is the Team Trump. It's the Trump campaign as a content creator. They approved my application last week, so that's kind of where I've been the last few days. Uh, I've been focusing a lot on content creation and just getting content out the door and onto social media. So if you want to follow that content, follow the show on social media. Find me on TikTok. It's anywhere you type Stephen Toriello. This is what I tell my friends and anybody that I talk to. If you want to find my show or my social media, just literally go to your search engine, whichever one you want to use. I don't want to promote Google, so we're not going to go there. Whichever search engine you use, just type in my name, Stephen Toriello, and it will pull up all my stuff. It's actually one of the benefits of having a pretty crazy last name like Toriello. So just type in Stephen with the V T A U R I E L L O. I'll pull up all my social media. Follow me on TikTok. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Facebook. Um, I try and post a, a lot of content and content I think you would like. Photos, short form videos, audio clippets that I get from, from congressional hearings and just different interviews that are going on around the country in different media outlets. I do as much as I can to try and help Donald Trump, to try and help the, the, the America First movement. I'm just doing everything I can on top of working my day job too. So <laughs> so if I don't put out a show tomorrow or the next day, if I'm not putting out a show every day, at least you know that I am extremely busy. I'm still in the fight. I haven't gone anywhere. I'm just, sometimes I get a little too wrapped up in one content uh, aspect, like, you know, video production or whatever than the, than the audio podcast, which, listen, hopefully two hour episode made up for that. And you guys got informed with all the latest and greatest with what's going on. If you want to get a hold of me directly, you can get a hold of me at stephentorielshugmail.com. If you guys got any leads or if you just want to ask me a question, you can email me. I'll be more than happy to read it and I will respond back to you. Make sure you share the show with your friends and family. And as always, I want you guys to have a great day. I hope you had an excellent Father's Day weekend. God bless you and God bless America. You guys have a good one. Bye-bye.